Let's welcome in our co-host. He is the manliest octogenarian lumberjack I know, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Billy, good morning to you. Good morning, Rob. Adventure getting here this morning, but I'm glad to be here. Testosterone just pouring out of you this morning, (laughs) Bill. I understand a tree blocked the driveway. You went out and got the chainsaw. You didn't call for help. You went out and got the chainsaw. I had no choice. I had to be here a certain time. Help would not have arrived. I had to do it myself, Rob. Let's see those hands, Bill. Let's see those hands. (laughs) No, I uh, I have a long driveway, about a third of a mile, and I went around a curve, and there was a, a big big tree not a not a small sapling and unfortunately it was bedded on each side it, uh, the roots was in woods the top fell in another woods across the road so there's no way to go around it so i had to go through it rob had to go through it you didn't get the captain of the guard at the checkpoint to, to get into the compound to take care of that for you bill i i asked the checkpoint guard bonnie to <laughs> <laughs> why don't you let that person through and then i said get your chainsaw bonnie and go out and cut it up and well, she, what she did what she did a good woman Bill, a good woman is hard to find. How long did that take, Bill? Well, once I not got... Not asking Bonnie, but yeah. yeah. Once I, I have a couple of chainsaws. Once I got a chainsaw that would work, it didn't take too long. So. Good. Let's welcome in Maria Lawrence in as well. Maria, tilt your mic a little bit more. This way? Uh, yeah, there you go. That okay. way it's in front of your mouth. There you All right. There you. we go. Good morning there to you. Go. Good morning. Good morning. Good to be back. Thank good you for here. coming in. Did you Absolutely. cut? Did you cut a tree down? This I did morning? not cut a tree down this morning. <laughs> oh, you're minus I, one then. I am. Yeah. I am. But I saw your text bright and early and responded that <laughs> you needed to take care and not, you know. But not, you did not volunteer to come over and cut it up. It, it, we would have both been late. Trust <laughs> me on that one. Let's welcome in Senator Jason Barrett from the Capitol. Good morning, JB. Morning. <laughs> you cutting down any trees, <laughs> Senator? Uh, not yet. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, m- maybe, maybe figuratively, but not literally, for sure. Hear ya, hear ya. All right, uh, Jason, what have you been up to uh, legislatively this uh, these past two weeks in terms of bills that you personally are introducing? Well, there are a couple of bills that haven't hit the system yet that I've been working on over the last couple of weeks. Uh, I expect them to hit. Um, there's a bill, one today, the one that deals with the appointment of county commissioners or a county commissioner when there's a vacancy um, just to clarify the process uh, by which a county commission with five members uh, would select um, and fill a vacancy. Um, As you know, the issue in Jefferson County um, sparked a a lot of debate and um, it really was kind of unclear uh, as to when the commission cannot agree on a particular candidate to fill the vacancy, uh, the process after that, and the process currently uh, is really geared more towards a three-person commission where uh, the most tenured commissioner strikes a name uh, and then the, 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 the remaining commissioner then strikes a second name and the third person that's left becomes the commissioner. Well, um, when you have five members, a five-member commission, you obviously have one vacancy, you have four sitting commissioners. In the instance of Jefferson County, Commissioner Tab had, uh, was the most tenured, and then Commissioners uh, Stolfer and uh, Jackson, uh, their tenures were, were equal. And so um, in that situation, Commissioner Stolfer deferred to Commissioner Jackson, but um, the statute was really silent on what to do about that. So uh, what my bill does um, it does a couple of things. Number one, it requires that the appointee come from an open district, um, an open magisterial district. That's the first thing it does. The second thing it does um, is to uh, kind of change the way in which um, these uh, strikes are made. And, and again, this is all assuming that the commission cannot agree on a replacement. So the way that it would work is that there were some – uh, some folks were upset that this was a, a Republican vacancy, and uh, Commissioner Tab, who is is an independent, received the first strike. Um, so considering that, what this bill does, um, it puts party affiliation first when making the strike. So, uh, and it's based on the vacancy. So if the the vacancy was created by a commissioner who was a Democrat, for the sake of this conversation. Um, then the and, and the commission is then is made up of two Republicans and two Democrats. The two Democrats would get the first strikes, and they would be based on tenure, whoever was the most tenured. 
the Republicans then would then get the last two strikes. So the, so the executive committee will now appoint uh, or recommend five names to the commission so that each commissioner will get a strike, again, in the instance where um, uh, the county commission cannot agree on a candidate or on, a, on an appointee. Jason, in the situation like you had this year where you had two commissioners who had the same tenure, is there a tiebreaker there, like who got the most votes, for instance? Well, and so I, I went to the Secretary of State's office, and, and their recommendation was a draw. And, and I think that's the process by which, if there's ever a tied election, uh, where there's been a recount, there's been, uh, it's verified that there is a, a, a tie, it, it's a draw or a coin flip. And so um, we're essentially using that same process. So uh, in a scenario that I outlined to you, uh, that if the two Democrats were the first two to get the strike, they, it goes by tenure. If they were elected in the same year, um, there would be a draw as to who would who would uh, strike first and who would strike second. And so it's just a two names draw a name out of a hat, essentially. I got it. Would uh, that that seems like it's just kind of haphazard luck? Would it not make more sense to have the higher vote total get the first strike? I, I mean, I guess you could. Um, you know, I, I don't, and I'm, if, if the bill goes to committee and somebody wants to make that amendment, um, it, it doesn't matter to me. Um, a, a draw is just the easiest way to do it. I'm not suggesting it's the best way to do it. Uh, it was the recommendation from the Secretary of State's office. Um, I'm not married to that idea. Um, as long as it's fair uh, and it's known ahead of time, um, I, I'm open to any other suggestion. As you discuss this bill, were most of your colleagues familiar with the Jefferson County situation, or was that something that was more parochial to us in terms of interest? Uh, they were aware. I mean, it was covered statewide news. I'll, I'll tell you that the recommendation from the Secretary of State's office, they, they drafted a bill and I changed it. Um, they, their, their recommendation was to essentially leave it as is, uh, just making the clarification as to there is a draw uh, in a scenario where uh, two commissioners are tied with tenure who would be either first, second, or third in line. And so I made the change um, to start with political party affiliation, then to move to tenure and to require five names, um, and then also um, uh, to ensure that that person that is that is uh, on the that is appointed and, and on the list of five actually be from an open district. Did you seek any input or get any input from Jefferson County's commissioners? Um, I have talked to a couple of them uh, about the idea and what they thought. And, um, you know, so I, th th I mean, I've taken into consideration of, of several different opinions uh, as to what the best way to go about making this appointment. And, and just to be clear, uh, the change that I just mentioned that the individual has to be from an open um, district and the party affiliation comes before tenure uh, will also apply to three member commissions. Bill, uh, yeah, uh, I guess I guess you're right, Jason. That it's uh, to me that's uh, uh, the whole situation in Jefferson County uh, was less on procedure as opposed to philosophy. Uh, but yeah, I think there was a problem, and I congratulate you for for fixing the problem. Well, we haven't gotten there yet. The bill is going to be introduced. I expect it to go to the Senate Government Organization Committee. Um, I, I think we'll, the committee will certainly run. I serve as the vice chair. We'll, we'll certainly run that bill. We'll, we'll take into consideration what the members of that committee, what they think of it. If there's any changes that they deem necessary, uh, then I would expect the bill to go to the Senate floor where we would go kind of through the same process but open to all 34 senators. Yeah, looking backward as opposed to looking forward, uh, there have been over the years many, many vacancies in with elected officials, and this is the first one, first situation I can remember that it did not, the replacement did not go fairly smoothly. So, Yeah, and, and again, I want to be clear, this bill only addresses the process that the county commission makes. It, yeah. it in no way um, says what the, the county executive committee has to do with the exception of, in, a, in an instance with a five-member commission, that they have to provide five names to the commission, um, not three. That's, it, it doesn't get into any of the how a vote is taken by the executive committee, doesn't get into any of that. It is just the, the, the procedure that the county commission should follow. 
Uh, Jason, I, uh, you, Rob asked several that you were sponsoring, and you mentioned one. But before you go to the, your, the rest of your list, let me go to a bill that's been proposed in the House by Brandon Steele, House Bill 4654, which in effect says if a library, museum, or school has obscene quotes, and that's always difficult to define, obscene material uh, on the shelves that the librarian, school, or museum uh, subject to a $25,000 fine or five year in jail. Uh, two questions. One, do you see, do you anticipate that bill making it through the House? And if it does make it through the House, how, how do you think it'll be received on the Senate side? Uh, I can't speak to what um, it would do in the House. That's not my monkeys and not my circus. But um, it, it seems to me on the surface that that penalty uh, is, is, rather large and you know i remember um i was in, did a book report in marksburg high school and i got a and this was obviously a long time ago uh, but i remember checking out a book in the marksburg library reading about i don't know 40 50 pages of that um, and then trying to figure out how i was going to write a book report on that without um, getting in trouble with the teacher because of the language that was in that book um, so i you know i think that there has to be um you know, there there are books, there are um, there are things that I don't believe belong in a public library. Um, I know a lot of folks talk about the Diary of Anne Frank. Well, that you know, and I remember talking about the Diary of Anne Frank, reading the Diary of Anne Frank in, in seventh grade at South Middle School. Uh, but what a lot of people don't know is that there are some very graphic language that is taken out of uh, the Diary of Anne Frank when middle school children and elementary school children or, or, or high school, whatever, read that uh, diary. And so, um, you know, I, I think we have to be mindful that these are young, impressionable minds, and there are some things that are just inappropriate. And, um, I, again, I, I think maybe the, the $25,000 fine and five, and five years in prison for some harsh language in a book or, or something else that's inappropriate, um, while there you know, has to be some type of, of – recourse, but I, I just sending somebody to jail for five years. I, again, I, I'm, I'm speculating a little bit, which I probably shouldn't do because I haven't read this bill. I have, it, it's, it's hard enough to keep it up with all the Senate bills. Trying to do that with House bills at this point um, is impossible. So we typically don't deal with House bills until they make it over to the Senate and we start to talk about in our caucus what's going to make an agenda and what's not. What percentage of proposed bills become law in a typical 60-day session, Jason? 20? 10? Uh, I would say in the 10, I think we typically are in the 250 bill range, I think, that actually become law. There's probably 2,500, at least 2,500 that are introduced. So, you, you know, you, you, you're you a fool if you try to read all 2,500 bills. I mean, you, you have to be, you know, have a little experience down here and be mindful of what's going to get traction, what's not, where you need to you know, to spend your time and efforts to, to understand specific legislation as it relates to the committee agendas that you serve, the committees you serve on and, you know, talking with the chair of, of you know, having understanding of what bills they, they think they want to run. In our caucus in the, in the, in the Senate, Republican caucus in the Senate, uh, it is uh, very open. Uh, everybody knows what the game plan is. Everybody knows the direction that we're going. The, we talk at length about the bills that are going to be on the agenda bills that, um, you know, are going to be in the committee that particular day. And that's really the reason to, um, you know, to caucus every morning at 830. So uh, we have a very informed caucus. Everybody is up to speed of, of the direction we're going. Maria. So, um, Jason, speaking of uh, bills that may or may not have traction, certainly some come to the um, rise to the top in terms of media coverage. What about the death penalty bill? Um, that is going to have some... Um... Yeah, there's two separate ones. Okay. Stewart's and Blair's. Okay. Uh, and Jason, both are being both are senators. So right. can you right, co right, right. comment we, on those? Yeah. You want to talk about those, Jason, and, and where you think those are going to go? And um... uh, Well, the short answer is not really, but I will. Um, I, don't, <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> I haven't heard, to be honest, in the past several days. It's, it's not a bill that I've, I've heard anybody mention really in the past week. Um, I... I those bills, I'm sure, are a reference to judiciary. I now serve on the Judiciary Committee. They haven't made our agenda. Uh, I haven't um, 
the, the members of the committee really haven't said anything to me about it. I haven't discussed that in, in a number of, of days or weeks. Uh, it's not something that I'm uh, overly supportive of or, or looking forward to. That's just my personal opinion. Um, I certainly understand um, people's feelings on it and why folks think to, think it's a good idea, um, and and using it as a deterrent, um, you know, for fentanyl distribution or 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 any or any crime that 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 whether it be murder or murdering a, a law enforcement. I understand why people feel the way they do, but um, you know, if you if you get ten thousand, if you if you um, put to death 10,000 people that were guilty and then you put to death one person that was innocent, is it worth it? And the answer to, in my mind, is no. Um, so, um, but again, I don't know that it would ever happen. Um, it, it may just be used more of a deterrent than, than actual um, implementation of it, so. When is crossover date, Jason? I don't know. So where is it? A, month. a couple yeah. of so, months now. <laughs> a couple so weeks Too away. far down the road from me yeah. to know okay. this. Okay. Bill. What's, what's the second bill that you are working on, Jason, that you're sponsoring? Um, let me get to that. But real quick, what I, what I want to say first, if you don't mind, is on third reading today on the Senate floor is a bill um, that puts 911 operators into the EMS retirement system. And you'll recall a couple of years ago, I passed a bill when I was in the House that moved paid firefighters paid county firefighters from the PER system, the public employee retirement system, to the EMS retirement system. Uh, when we did that, we also included new 911 operators, so new, new hires, folks that, that don't that hadn't worked in the 911 system yet. Um, the bill today, uh, we've worked on it for a number of years. Uh, I have, along with Senator Nelson, who is the pensions chair, um, to, to put all 911 operators across the state. And there's a process by which all these 911 centers and the operators have to take a vote. Uh, it's something that, that our 911 center in Berkeley County uh, has really uh, helped lead the effort and the charge uh, to get this legislation passed, so they're to be commended for that. Um, so that's a bill that I'm, I'm optimistic today will probably pass unanimously. Uh, hopefully we can get support across, that, uh, across the way in the House uh, because this is a very stressful job. Uh, for these 911 operators, or it puts them in a little bit better retirement system. Now, to answer your question, the other bill is something that I've talked about on this show a number of times, uh, and it deals with uh, bail and setting bail and when uh, specifically magistrates. There are some instances, and, and, and again, this, this is different places all over the state. It's not just one particular area or another, but there have been instances where um, someone gets charged with a crime that's, that that comes the penalty comes if found guilty comes with no jail time. However, magistrates will set a bail of cash only, and it could be five hundred dollars, it could be a few hundred dollars, and they know that the individual, the defendant, does not have five hundred dollars. So what happens is that individual sets in jail at fifty four dollars and eighty eight cents or fifty four forty eight, whatever it is, to the county for three or four or five not three or four nights, uh, and at that point the magistrate will change to a personal recognizance bond. Um, and let that person out. So essentially, two things are happening. One, we're running up a jail bill unnecessarily for a county to put somebody in jail that the penalty of the crime they're charged with doesn't even is not even a jailable offense. And two, we've essentially um, penalized or or uh, issued a penalty for someone. Um, that has a sentence is the word I'm looking for. We essentially sentence somebody three or four days in jail before they even go to trial. Um, and so what this does, it says that the defendant has the right to choose between a cash bail, a property uh, bond, or uh, to use a bail bondsman. And that's it was left entirely up to the defendant. And so there was an instance um, in the Potomac Highlands where 28 individuals in a row, uh, a magistrate there uh, issued a cash-only bond. And I think that's unfair to the defendant. Again, you are innocent until proven guilty still, um, as much as sometimes it doesn't feel that way. That is the case. Uh, so the bill uh, does that. And then there are also some instances where I think magistrates PR individuals that shouldn't. And there was one um, fairly recently, not in Berkeley or Jefferson County, but, but close, um, that the individual was charged with um, uh, strangulation and rape and, and a couple of different very heinous crimes, lived in another state, 
and was given a personal recognizance bond. So um, the bill also uh, does not allow magistrates to offer PR bonds, personal recognizance bonds, in, in an instance of a felony um, and, and some other serious misdemeanors. That's just such common sense. I'm surprised that it's not already the law. Well. Actually, maybe I, I shouldn't agree. be, I guess. I don't know. Well, yeah. And I, I mean, I think the, the, in all fairness, I think the, the, the code is a little murky on whether magistrates can issue PR bonds for felonies. Now, and this doesn't change what circuit judges can do. This, this, this bill only, uh, only affects magistrates. What percentage, if you if, if, the, if you know the information, is made up of jail costs from folks who would be affected by the first bill you were just talking about there in regards to keeping somebody in prison three days at 55 bucks a day because they can't afford the bill? I, I, the Supreme Court could probably, I think we've asked for information like that from the court. I don't know that they've ever provided it. Um, but I, I mean, I would... I say that, that this cash and in Kanawha County, for example, they have judges that testified before the jails committee uh, in the interims and, and said, we don't allow bail bondsmen and we do cash only. Well, I mean, you're I, I just I think that's, you know, it, it's like going to buy a car and the car dealerships say, you know what, we're only taking cash today. You can't go to the bank and get a loan. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that and that's an oversimplification. I understand that. But um, I, I think that, the, again, the defendant is innocent until proven guilty. And they should be able to use whatever method they come up with uh, to be able to, to meet the requirement that the magistrate or the judge set. And so, you know, a, a lot of um, a lot of these judges across the state, specifically in Kanawha County, don't like bail bondsmen. And and there are bad actors in that industry, just like there are bad actors in every industry. Uh, and we have in the past several years regulated uh, bail bondsmen through the Office of the Insurance Commissioner, which about 28 or 29 other states already do uh, to, to make it so that it isn't the wild, wild west with this industry that, that you know, we've made an effort to clean it up. Um, and, you know, they, the, 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 the charge for a bail bondsman is 10%. Um, and, and you lose that 10%. It's not something that's refundable. Uh, but again, it's the choice the individual makes. And if you have a $1,000 bond and you want to pay $100 to the bondsman, and that's, you would rather do that and be out and lose a hundred dollars because that's the that's the the ten percent fee. It's a hundred dollars to the bondsman. You'd rather lose that hundred dollars than sit in jail for three or four nights. That's a decision you should be able to make. Uh, mm-hmm. The court, the magistrate, should not make that decision for you. Jason, a uh, uh, statement on a very a quick question. Uh, Summer responded that the crossover date is February the twenty eighth. So we have. She would know better than yeah, I would. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Uh, we we discussed it last week, but just in passing. But a, a potential bill, and I have to use the word potential because I don't know where it is, uh, that's got quite a bit of interest in the Eastern Panhandle, is the expiration of the, uh, of the or the termination of easements by making them less and in perpetuity. Where is that bill? Do you know where I, it is? I I, I don't ha- I haven't seen it. Um, okay. I don't know. I mean, there's still a lot of talk about it. There's a lot of um, from my understanding, and I'm not there, I'm here, but there are a lot of rumors in the Eastern Panhandle that are not true that I think are being stirred by folks, um, not necessarily from the Eastern Panhandle, but from this area um, that, that are untrue. So we're, I, 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 it's still a work in progress as far as I'm concerned. I think there are um, some issues that, that probably need addressed, um, but um, I, I haven't seen a bill to be able to tell you what's in it or what's not in it. And, guys, I do have to run. I apologize. Yes, Caucus is starting right now, we so I do you. need to go. Thank, Thanks, you, Jason. Right. Thank, Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Thanks. Take care.